Hey there, David Chesworth coming to you for another episode of Health Talk. I'm here at Hilton Head Health on the beautiful Hilton Head Island. And today I've got a very special guest. Her name is Dr. Robin Pashby. She is currently the owner and director of Health Psychology Partners in DC. She's a dual track PhD in medical and clinical psychology. She's got 20 years experience in clinical practice um, with a focus on eating, weight, internalized weight bias, anxiety, and relational concerns. She is an active member of the National Board of Directors of the Obesity Action Coalition um, and has been a research assistant professor of psychology at the F. Edward Herbert School of Medicine at the, at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. So I'm going to bring Dr. Pashby on screen with me. Dr. Pashby, did I miss anything about your introduction there? I think that's a lot. You're aging me with my 20 years experience, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. That means you're going to have a wealth of knowledge for our That's right. Today. That's right. Wise. Wise with my time. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I was wondering if you could start by just sharing a little bit about the, the health psychology partners in D.C. that you started. Sure. So we are a group uh, health psychology practice. I have a team of five uh, other additional amazing psychology providers. Um, and we really all specialize at the intersection of physical and mental health. So we have a physical location in Washington, D.C., but we also see patients virtually all over the United States. Oh, that's amazing. So when did it when did you start it? So I've been in iterations. We actually just rebranded our practice in the last couple months. Before that, we were DC Health Psychology uh, for about the last seven or eight years. But with the expansion of our telehealth footprint across the US, we decided to rebrand and, and sort of more accurately reflect our geography expansion. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So, and, uh, and so in one of your specialties that you mentioned that was mentioned is internalized weight bias. And I was wondering if you can explain a little bit about what that looks like and how it manifests. Sure. So, I mean, I think anyone listening to this podcast or watching this podcast who has lived with struggles around weight will relate to the idea that the world treats people uh, sometimes not so fairly and differently if you live with a larger body. And so that's called weight bias or weight stigma or weight discrimination, right? And it's basically this idea that based on how you look, essentially, the size of your body, there are stigmatizing experiences you have in the world. So what happens over time for a lot of folks is that when you live in a world that persists in telling you that you're not as good or that there's something wrong with you or that you're lazy or incompetent or all the other words, over time, those things start to creep into how you see yourself. And so internalized weight bias is what happens when really often smart, educated uh, you know, people sort of start to believe things about themselves that aren't true based on the, the messaging that we've heard often from the time we're little, little kids, right? There's some data that kids as young as preschool actually show a preference for thinner bodies. Um, so that's, wow. that's like, it's sort of in the water, if you will, right? Like it's really baked into our society. And mm -hmm. so what happens over time is that people start to internalize that experience of being othered based on their body size and begin to believe about themselves that they are lazy or lacking willpower or lacking self-control or lacking discipline. Those are all the hot button words that people experience. And so, and then that, of course, doesn't feel great, right? It has all sorts right. of consequences. Yeah, no, so it's almost like just things, it, when you're a kid, you might get teased or your parents might say something. And over time, I guess it kind of influences your, your self-talk. Is that, Absolutely. is that basically? Even, I would actually say, David, I'll go even deeper than that. So okay. self-talk, 100%, but more importantly, self-beliefs, right? Because the beliefs about ourselves are actually the, the seed which brings forth the self-talk. And mm. so beyond the self-talk, it's like, why do people say things to themselves like, what's wrong with me if they gain five pounds? It's not because they actually, in that moment, think something's wrong with them. It's because these beliefs that sort of grow over time have taught them that something's wrong with you. And so I think internalized weight bias is, is trickier than just self-talk because it's much yeah. deeper. Yeah. That, 
that correction actually really resonates with me because there's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm and which leads me to another question. I'm really curious to hear your take on it. So the affirmations um, is is basically it, there's it seems like there's different schools of thought around affirmations, and it seems like that there's probably more effective ways to approach it and less effective ways to approach it. And I, I wonder how, mu how important is it when doing affirmations or trying to shift your self-talk that in, when you're trying to change it, that you believe everything you're saying? Because it, it, it seems to me like if you just like fake it till you make it, is, is that the right approach to fake it till you make it? Or how do you change the way you believe about yourself? So, um you just asked what I've spent 20 years understanding. <laughs> and, uh, I'll try to condense that in a podcast. Um, essentially, no. right? Um, look, do I believe that affirmations can help? Yes. But I don't think that they fix underlying belief structures, right? I think mm -hmm. a solid therapeutic process mm -hmm. is what helps change belief structures. Um, the, when you sort of consciously decide to let's say step on the scale, which is a big trigger for negative self-talk for a lot of folks, right? Mm -hmm. And you decide to yourself like, okay, if the scale is up, rather than launch into the whole, what's wrong with me, I'm such a failure, I can't do this, I'm going to change my self-talk to sound something more balanced, something like, mm -hmm. look, losing weight is not easy. I've been mm -hmm. working at it and yes, there are, that, you know, I can feel disappointed about what I see, but it is not a reflection of who I am or what's in my brain or, or anything about mm. my character. That's really important, right? That's a shift in self-talk. But if people can work on that self-talk for a really long time and not see much shift in those like underlying core beliefs, and those mm -hmm. beliefs have to be adjusted very thoughtfully, I think, because a lot of times they are they're not just in you, right? They're like in family dynamics, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're interpersonally consolidated in marriages or in friendships or in mother, daughter, or father, son relationships. And so we have to look a little deeper than just how you talk to yourself. So it's almost like with self-talk, if I, uh, I'm going to try to reframe what you said is you, you kind of try to reframe it in a less personal way, more objective, maybe more curious way, and that can help maybe mitigate the emotional response, but not necessarily change the way you believe about the underlying belief, um, which might require a deeper therapeutic process. I think that's a great way of putting it. Okay. So, I mean, I'm, does it really depend on the individual or are there like key strategies with like what the therapeutic process would look like for changing so your belief? Yeah, so it does depend, right? I mean, I would want to know from a person like, where do those beliefs come from, right? If it's a dynamic that has been, you know, a person, let's say, gains weight uh, postpartum, like after having a baby and going through perimenopause and is gaining some weight and really struggling with that, they might have a whole different belief structure than someone who has struggled with weight from the time they're two years old and have mm -hmm. been told their whole lives that they are different, not good enough, don't fit in, need to go to a special store and need to do all these other things, right? So right. those are very different experiences. I'm not saying one is better, easier or worse. I'm just saying right. that what the process is to sort of unfold that might look a little different by person. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, so how, what, why do people, I guess, let me shift gears a little bit around emotionally eating because I feel, I think that the same type of demographic, at least that we see here at Hilton Head Health, we, uh, we see a lot of people who come here for weight management purposes and a lot of them struggle with the emotional mental side of it. And, and that's really been the bedrock of our program from the very beginning is that change your mind, change your behavior and fitness and nutrition are pillars of it. But without the mindset and the, the psychology of it, it's going to be more challenging. Right. Um, but emotional eating seems to be a, a common struggle amongst people. Why do people emotional eat and why is it important to address that? So I think I'll start by tying this into the first question. Okay. Internalized weight bias shows up and there are plenty of data, by the way, this is not just my musings. There's plenty of data out there to support this, yeah. that internalized weight bias shows up in lots of different formats, psychologically mm -hmm. through depression, anxiety, interpersonal struggles, um, low self-esteem, low quality of life. 
physically through uh, poorer health, high blood pressure, the, like excess weight gain, um, disordered eating, so and emotional eating. So to sort of tie those together, why do people emotionally eat? Some people emotionally eat because there's unaddressed internalized weight bias. Mm -hmm. It's not something that most weight management programs talk about. It's not something that, you know, certainly any of the commercial weight management, you know, apps or other things address because it's such a personal, vulnerable, shame-filled experience that people don't mm -hmm. want to openly talk about it a lot. But that internalized weight bias, which often shows up through things like getting on the scale and telling yourself what a failure you are if it hasn't gone down, mm -hmm. is a trigger for emotional eating because, of course, we know that eating food, often high carbohydrate or high sugar or high fat, is releases a whole series of chemicals, right, neurologically mm -hmm. speaking, that help feel better in the moment. Mm -hmm. So when we're asking people to, you know, delay behavior, to think about long-term consequences versus short-term reward and those sorts of behavioral strategies, those are awesome. But unless we understand what's triggering people to get mm -hmm. there in the first place, and unless we understand what we're going to do about that trigger, for example, mm -hmm. internalized weight bias, then we're basically just sort of trying to change the behavior without changing any of the things upstream of that behavior. And then, of course, that doesn't really work out so well for most people. Gotcha. So so in many cases, it's almost like a dopamine shot is what yeah. the food provides. Right. Tem temporary relief of whatever discomfort is being felt. Right. And can you blame people? Right. right. I mean, if you think about it, yeah, first, life is hard, right? So all right. of us are stressed out and tired and all of that. World events are crazy and all of these things. But in addition, if you have lived with the messaging mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with you, you just don't have the same resiliency to cope a lot of times with the, mm -hmm. all the stressors of life without needing some extra help. There's no shame in that, right? It's right. like people need help and food is a pretty low cost, pretty widely accessible way doesn't hurt other people mostly, right? So if you think about it, it's it makes really good sense from like a survival, um, you know, like an yeah. evolutionary perspective. And it, it almost seems like if if you've gotten yourself to the point where you also have internalized it and you believe this about yourself, you might also follow the behaviors to reinforce that. Absolutely. And that's what the data show us, that the higher yeah. people's internalized weight bias, the more likely they are to avoid exercise, to mm -hmm. eat emotionally, to choose higher fat, higher carbohydrate, higher sugar foods. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, like, okay, what's the why? Let's talk about exercise. Why might someone who believes themselves to be lacking in willpower or less than, why might they avoid exercise? Well, where do people exercise? A lot of times mm -hmm. environments are not really safe spaces, right? If you go in there and everybody is in their, you know, fancy sports bras and, and tight pants yeah. and things, it's like really not a very safe place to go and mm -hmm. walk on the treadmill if you don't feel good in your body. Right. So there's there's lots of very obvious reasons where why these behaviors show up. So what would be like a, I'm going to guess this also probably depends on the person, but what are some common themes and examples of like first steps people can take to address their emotional eating? So I think, I, look, everybody knows the like, oh, don't keep it in your house or put it, you know, put foods at eye level that are healthier for you. We know all of those tricks, right? right? How many of us have learned those since the time we were five years old? <laughs> don't eat right. in front of the television. There's all those things, right? Um, and those all matter. But some people need additional help. And what I would mm -hmm. think about in that case would be, um, really looking at some of the mental health management, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it anxiety driven? Is it loneliness driven? Mm -hmm. Is it shame driven? Why are people using food this way? Is it that there's an interpersonal issue? Like I have so many people that come in and one of the main triggers to their eating is their dynamics in their relationship at home. And until we start to manage those dynamics between let's say partners or husband and wife or something, it's going to be really challenging to change the, the only soothing mm -hmm. behavior that people engage in. So mm -hmm. this is where it sort of is like a longer term thing. Right. And yes, those other sort of quick behavioral strategies really matter. But sure. if people have been sort of 
like circling the drain around emotional eating for a really long time, then I encourage them to go talk to a therapist because yeah. often through therapy, you can start to really disentangle like, oh, I'm not emotionally eating because I have chocolate chips in my house. <laughs> I'm emotionally <laughs> eating because I don't want to be, let's say, in this marriage anymore. Right. And that's a really scary thing that I'm faced with every night after 10 p.m. And I don't really know how to cope with that feeling. And so instead of coping with that feeling or or thinking through that and taking action, I turn to food to sort of disconnect from it, to numb out, to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, other people struggle with more advanced disordered eating, right? Binge eating disorder and other things, which is pretty highly or under diagnosed because mm -hmm. people don't really know like, oh, emotional eating to this to this um, level is actually has a name and has a treatment for it. Yeah. Oh, so our director of behavioral health, I, I think you know her and and Poyer. Yeah. She often poses the questions in her workshops and seminars. What are you really hungry for? Right. Um, and I don't know that I don't think she made that up. But um, and it was it's exactly what you just talked about. Is it hunger? Is it right. anger? Loneliness? Right. All those things. And I'll, you know, so one of the shortcut steps from a psychological perspective is really learning emotional vocabulary, mm -hmm. because if if what so many of my clients who are, by the way, like some of the smartest people I know come in and their vocabulary around emotion is like, I'm stressed or I'm upset or oh. I don't feel good, right? I feel bad. And that's so vague, so, it's so vague right? It could be a million <laughs> things. And therefore we don't really know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Versus I'm lonely for social connection. Mm. Then suddenly the, the, you know, panel of options opens up to us, right? Do I call a friend? Do I write a letter? Do I go for a walk with my neighbor? Do, right, there's suddenly a more direct sort of line, but just this vague like stress thing, it's really hard to cope with. Interesting, I, I hadn't considered that before. It, you're so right, I mean, I do that, I'm guilty of that too, just saying I'm stressed or I'm, I'm tired or whatever, just, right. just very general terms. Right. And right. if you don't actually pinpoint it, you probably can't really address it. Right. So for example, if a client comes in and says, you know, oh, I emotionally ate last night, I was feeling really bad or feeling really exhausted or something. And what happens through the course of a therapy session is we might get to actually, I was really disappointed that I had this big presentation when I came home, my significant other didn't ask how it went. Right. So I felt invisible. Uh -huh. Then suddenly we have a plan right? Because we can actually engage said significant other in this discussion around like, I felt really disappointed that you didn't, or I felt like you didn't care that I had this big thing go on, or yeah. I felt invisible or, and then, right. And oftentimes well-meaning partners are completely oblivious to this. Right. And so suddenly you get an improvement in the relationship. And of course you get an improvement in the eating because if you don't feel invisible, then you don't need to eat. Right. Then you, you don't feel the right the emotion the emotion to eat isn't driving it exactly at that point. Yeah. exactly right oh that's that's so fast so that actually reminded me of a, a small when I I started off as an intern here at Hilton Head Health almost twelve years ago and I had a fellow intern who was very technical and at the time it was kind of a pet peeve but hearing you say what you just said I think it was actually it, it's a very intelligent approach so I I, I it and I came into the office one day and I said oh you look tired. Um, and she said, it's not that I'm tired, it's that I'm fatigued. Uh, and at the time, I was like, come on. <laughs> but I get, you know, it was a more specific version of, of tired, and I, th I think it was really impressive, actually, how in tune she was with how she felt. Right. Yeah. Which then, David, wraps right back to internalized weight bias, because yeah. if, if the conditioning and the messaging and the self-talk for your whole life has been basically avoid everything from here down, right? Yeah. Don't look in the mirror, don't think about it, certainly don't try to, you know, understand it. Then we don't even understand what disappointment feels like in our bodies, right? right. We don't think about it like that. Whereas, I mean, certainly, not always, but sometimes I'm able to say like, oh, right, anger feels like really hot here, mm. right, or here versus sadness feels like that pit in your stomach, mm. you know, or fear feels like the butterflies in your stomach. Yeah. Right. Those are different experiences and they can tell us things if we listen. 
That's so fast. So how, how much, how common is it then in, in therapy that that's like a starting point where it's just, let's learn about how, how emotions affect you. Yes. Is that let's pretty much everybody? <laughs> right. I mean, there's a reason, was it Pixar maybe that made that movie Inside Out? Oh my God. I cried at that movie. Oh my gosh. Who didn't cry at that movie? Yeah. Um, and why? Because we don't really teach anyone in school mm -hmm. about emotions, right? The closest we get is like the pain chart with like a happy right. face all the way down to the really sad face. Um, <laughs> How are and, you, the magnet, how are you feeling today? Right, exactly, <laughs> the magnet. And so I think it's not, it's something to be ashamed of if people don't have a vocabulary around emotion. It's not really part of our culture to yeah. do that, right? Um, we do have these catch-all phrases and we're busy and all of those other things, but it mm -hmm. does mean that there's room for most people to really do some work there and and see huge gains in mm -hmm. in how they're managing their food, how they're managing their health. Same with exercise behavior, right? It's not just mm -hmm. eating. So I want to go for a walk when I get home from work, but I'm stressed when I get home. And what does that actually mean? Who knows? It means all sorts of things for different people. Yeah. W would you say that the, the, the emotional eating is common in both male and female or... It, but maybe just express a little differently. Yeah, I think, look, I, I, you know, the differences between genders is so, yeah. I don't know, it, yeah, whatever it is. Um, what I see is that people, people of all genders, all sexual orientations, all of that struggle with recognizing emotions. And so we need to work on that no matter what. Yeah. And there's certainly a societal pressure, right, for men to be tough or whatever. Right. But, you know, for a lot of my clients who are very professional, successful women, there's that same pressure, you know. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we're very career driven or stakes are high and right. emotions are weak. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you can't whatever, cry yeah. in a boardroom, right? I right. Mean, and, right. And not be like broadcast all over the news. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So you, a few times over this discussion, you've mentioned shame. And I'm curious what role shame plays in many of your clients' lives and in, in the endeavor against internalized weight bias mm -hmm. and what tools people can use to navigate shame. Mm -hmm. Shame is one of the most difficult feelings that people express and experience. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, when I'm training new team members that join my health psychology partners, I say, look, we all work with chronic health conditions. Many of us work in the world of weight management or disordered eating. All of us treat shame, really. That's mm. really what we're treating because mm. almost always people come in here knowing, oh, would it be better for me to eat carrots than chips? Yes, right? Like, mm -hmm. would it be better if I went for a walk instead of watching a movie? Yes, fine. Not that nutrition is not important. I love my dietitian colleagues. Not that exercise is not important. I was a personal right. trainer for many years. I believe in it so much. But because they already know what it mm -hmm. would look like if they had to write out like their plan, right? Their schedule, mm -hmm. how they would eat, what they would eat, how much they would move, how much they would sleep, how much water they would get, how many relationships they would nurture, all these things. <laughs> right. but, but what is in that gap between what people know and what people do? Mm. The answer, David, is emotion. <laughs> emotion is in between doing and knowing. Mm. And a lot of times that emotion is shame. So mm. from my perspective, people already know what to do, mm -hmm. but they don't engage in it because they're busy managing shame to the best of their ability. And if you're busy managing shame, it's a little bit like, you know, you're, you fall overboard and you're like struggling to get to the life raft. And someone is like, Hey, mm. while you're out there, do you mind if you like, you know, make your meal plan for the week? <laughs> You're like, okay, it's not that the meal plan isn't important, but I'm like kind of dying here, right? right? I'm really struggling out here. So I can't really focus on that right now. So that's how I think of it. It's like people respect and need nutrition and movement and all of those important pieces, but not if they're struggling so much with this internalized stuff. It, it, Makes a lot of sense. I mean, 
emotion, emotions can be so draining and you can have the best of intentions and the best plan. And, and I mean, I often say this in, when I cover our motivation class, um, you can have the best plan, all the knowledge, all the resources, and you can still not feel like it. Yes. And a, a lot of times, if you're like you said, if you're dealing with something as heavy as emotionally heavy as shame, it can be hard to get any willpower or motivation to do anything. It so doesn't what even would matter, right? It doesn't. Yeah. Even, yeah. So uh, how does one begin to, I guess, healthfully address shame? Because it's probably an, an, an inevitable experience, human experience at some point that you have shame. But I yeah. guess it becomes a problem if you dwell on it or if, if you can't get rid of it um, or move past it. So one of the things that I have learned from my ex personal experiences and my uh, client experiences is that the struggle with weight is very unique because people mm -hmm. wear it, right? Yeah. And so if someone is struggling with other sh what so our society says are shameful experiences, right? Like, oh, you, I don't know, like are, uh, you know, non-monogamous with your wife and you hadn't agreed to that right or something like that so in our yeah. culture that's sort of frowned upon right right but you hide it so you're not mm -hmm. marching around every day wearing a t-shirt that says this is what i do <laughs> right um, right? Right. <laughs> um but if you're living with weight struggles often those are worn around with you every day so you're constantly battling in your head like navigating a world that is treating you a certain way and sort of dealing with like your own self-talk around that as well. And so mm -hmm. I think it's it's challenging to address these things sort of just through self-talk. I think, again, a plug for therapy, right? Like having yeah. someone that understands what internalized weight bias is, having someone that understands how that shows up in your exercise behavior, your, your eating behavior and so forth, and your relationships is really important work. Yeah, so the first step could be talking to somebody a professional. Absolutely. And of course, you know, there's so many good resources on shame out there. Mm -hmm. um, Brene Brown popularized it, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think her work is amazing because it basically normalizes the shame experience. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. really helpful. And that's not often enough, right? A lot of people sort of understand right. like, oh yes, shame is a mutually shared experience. But when you're in it, when you're deep in it, in that moment, it's really right. hard to care if Karen next door also has it, right? It just like, just doesn't yeah. matter in the same way when you're like struggling. Right. It's all, would you say it's almost like blinders are put on and you, does shame contribute to feeling isolated? Well, so yes, shame, contributes to feeling isolated and being isolated in our culture feels shameful. The shame wow. of loneliness, being a non plus one, for example, mm -hmm. or being feeling alone in an unhappy relationship or feeling alone in a big family where you're lost. Right. So Yes, it's shame. The experience of shame can be isolating, but the experience of being isolated also feels shameful. So it's sort of reciprocal that way. It's like it becomes a cycle when you get in it. And I think, you know, the motivation comment you made is so important because I think people are not unmotivated to eat right. better or move more, right? right? Or to sleep better or to have better marriages or whatever. The it's desire's that, there. The desire's there. The, the, the energy is there often, but that is all often being directed to a different motivation that is in some ways competing with the motivation to change. And right. that is to regulate emotion because emotion regulation is like a primary driver for most of us, for most of our behaviors. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, even in, when you measure like a resting metabolism, I think they say the brain takes up 60% of your energy needs, yes. <laughs> something like that. Most of your energy needs. So if your emotions are weighing on you, I can imagine that would probably take even more energy. Exactly. And so, so many clients come to me and I'm sure to you guys too, saying like, I really just want to lose weight, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, help me <laughs> yeah. with the, and, and I always say, it's like the um, equation, right? X plus Y equals Z. And all they want to focus on is Z the outcomes. Yes. Right. Yes. And I'm like, we totally. can't, if you don't change the variables that are contributing to Z 
And some of those, by the way, are environmental, social, psychological, relational, biological, genetic, right? It's much more complex right. than nutrition right. and movement. There's works. a few more letters in that equation for most people. <laughs> yes, a lot of them. <laughs> right, exactly. But, and I also, full awareness here, that feels really overwhelming yeah. for people who are in that position where I said, like, they've fallen right. overboard, right? If you're really struggling and someone's like, well, we got to go, you know, letter by letter here, it can feel so disempowering and so mm -hmm. hopeless. Like, when am I ever going to make any change or make any headway mm -hmm. on this? And so, again, that's a, a plug to talk to someone about it because it's certainly not hopeless. It's more yeah. hopeful, but in a realistic way. Well, and way. it seems like, um, and this is something where I, I'm, I would defer to you to say if this is the right observation or not. It seems like if that doesn't get addressed, even if you do achieve X weight on the scale, you haven't addressed the shame and maybe you lost the weight quickly and and you, you think that if you see that number on the scale, it will get rid of the uncomfortable feelings. But if you haven't addressed the feelings along the way, they're probably not going to go away and you might gain it all back. So there's so many factors that drive mm -hmm. weight regain. The first and most primary is just simply right. biology, biology, right? Our bodies want us to maintain a right. higher weight. It's biologically that way. So there is already that pull. And yes, if people haven't, I mean, everyone can do things for like a short right. amount of time, right? But weight management is a long-term lifelong right. process of management. And so we do have to understand what keeps people going mm -hmm. when, especially when, you know, in that beginning time when people are losing weight, the reinforcement that we get, it's like another dopamine hit, right? You get a dopamine hit when you see the scale number go mm -hmm. down if what you're driving for is weight loss. But eventually everyone stops losing weight and we hopefully go mm -hmm. into weight maintenance, right? Yeah. And then suddenly that primary dopamine hit that we used to get, which is watching the numbers go down, disappears. And mm. then what? Or people will say, I want to lose weight because my knees hurt so badly. Okay. So knee pain is a driving factor. But what happens over time when you maybe change your weight and start, you know, working with a physical therapist and all these things, and then your pain goes away. It's amazing. And if that's the only reason you are engaging in these behaviors, then suddenly the dopamine hit you right. got goes away. So we have to think long term, like, what are the reasons I'm doing this? And that's mm -hmm. to me why I so encourage people to think about the mental and emotional aspects. If you feel emotionally, for example, proud of yourself when you get to the gym, that mm -hmm. is a reward. And that's there. I've been exercising for, I don't know, 30 years or something. Like, it doesn't matter now or 30 years ago. I'm still darn yeah. proud of myself every time I do a workout, right? No matter if it's a 15 minute workout or an hour long workout because I make a conscious effort. That's where self-talk comes in. I make a conscious effort mm -hmm. to remind myself how totally awesome it is that I took time out to move my body. That's such an interesting way that you just framed that because one of the things that we talk about in our program here is the difference between external motivators and internal motivators. And that external motivators are like the, I'll be happy when fill in the blank. And then internal motivators is like the reward is from the activity itself. And what you just described was the dope what when the dopamine hit happens how, how that when the dopamine happens from the outcome then that's external motivation when the dopamine happens from the action that you did that's this more sustainable dopamine hit exactly and those and and i think this is where the i always say to my clients like if they always say what's the magic right what's like the secret yeah. sauce or something and honestly what i say is consistency with the huge flashing caveat that consistency is only achieved through flexibility, right? And so over the course, I'll use myself as an example because I give myself permission. <laughs> I don't have to out any of my patients. But like, so over the course of the number of years I've been exercising regularly, I have gone through bouts where during COVID, I did yoga for like 260 wow. days straight. Why? Because yeah. we were all going out of our minds, right? <laughs> like, I was That's like, awesome. this is something I can do. Um, other times I've uh, engaged in training for a, like a half marathon or a marathon. Other times I've been obsessed with spin class. Right now I'm doing Krav Maga. Cool. 
like, I don't know. I'm just doing different things. Right. And if I, at some point, what happened along the way is like, oh, I kind of got burned out on doing yoga. If I had told myself the story with one of these like invisible rules that we have in our head about eating and exercise, that I have to do yoga to be fit or an athlete or whatever, then when I burned out on yoga, guess what mm, happens, stop right? I stop. But instead, I'm like thinking flexibly, mm -hmm. flexibly and thinking, I just want to move my body. Mm -hmm. I don't care for how long. I don't care what I'm doing. I just want to move it. That's my ultimate goal. And so then 30 years passes because I've been really flexible in how I exercise, how often um, or how much or, you know, how intensely those have varied, right? Doing a 20 minute yoga class is very different than going out on a 10 right. mile training run. I love So what you just said, so consistent, but flexible. Our director of education here, Bob Wright, you might know him too, actually. Yeah. He, uh, he uses the term structured flexibility. So having a plan yeah. um, and not beating yourself up if you have to adapt, be flexible. And um, basically that same message of fighting that all or nothing tendency that many of us struggle with. Yeah, we all struggle with it. Totally. Right? I struggle with it. And uh, like pretty much all I do every day is talk <laughs> about this. So um, I don't expect my clients who are like running businesses and families and all these other things, right, who don't obsessively right. think about this like I do uh, to not struggle. It's with part it. of the human experience. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It really well, and especially is. if if the all or nothing approach has proven to be successful in one area of their life, but not all areas of their life. Right, right. right. And well, and that's where it gets mm -hmm. tricky with weight, too, because there's periods of time where all or nothing right. really works, mm -hmm. right? These sort of restrictive diets and things works if the outcome, the only outcome you care right. about is weight loss. And so that's why I know you guys, too, we work so hard to move people away from like a sole focus on the number Definitely. on the scale or the pant yeah. size, right? Like this is about, and this is where I think mental health mm -hmm. matters so much, right? You will feel less stressed out if you go for a walk every day of yeah. your life, you will yes. get that reward, <laughs> right? Whether the scale moves exactly. or not, you are going to feel better. And if you feel better than doing all the other things that, so if we feel mm -hmm. better, that's the emotion. That's what's in between what you know right. and what you do. I so, love that. So if you can if you can cultivate the emotions by doing something consistently that you that's realistic and flexible, you're going to shift your emotions to one that will move you more towards action. Yes, it's yeah. more conducive, right? If you've just come back from a walk and you feel great and your son or daughter says, "Hey, do you want to go shoot some hoops?" The answer is so much easier a yes than if you're like sitting on your couch, scrolling, <laughs> doom scrolling your phone for the last three hours and your yeah. hips are sore. So, so while we don't have a, a significant amount of therapy here on site here, we do have a lot of coaching. And, and I think what you yes. just talked about really hits on s the importance of SMART goals and the R realistic. And so like if setting a very realistic goal that you can definitely achieve, because when you achieve it, you're going to be more confident. You're going to feel better. You're probably going to do more. Right. Right. And so in, in therapy, certainly sure. we set SMART goals, but what happens is then we're there to really dig in and figure out what happens when the SMART yeah. goal falls apart or why is it when you are with a coach, you say, okay, yes, I'm going to set a SMART goal of a 15 minute walk. That yeah. feels very realistic, very doable. And then I didn't do it all week. Yeah. Why? Right. Why? And the why is often because of this whole slew of invisible rules in your head that told you the minute you said out loud 15 minutes, immediately told you mm. not good enough, not not long enough, not hard enough, not mm -hmm. going to burn enough calories, not right, doesn't matter, is going to take too much time away from the responsibilities I have at home. And so in therapy, what we do is we really pick apart all of those things. Like what are the belief yeah. structures there? What are those interfering thoughts? Because we have right. time to do that, right? We have time to like dig in. And I mean, I I love pairing therapy. Yeah, it coaching. seems like a brilliant approach. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, with that example you just gave is so interesting because that person, someone with that thought process, probably has an all or nothing mindset because if it's if it's not if it's not the thirty minutes of the hour, why bother? 
because, it, because 15 minutes, if, if it doesn't matter, is now too much time and it's taking away from other stuff in my day. Exactly. And here's the funny thing. Probably 99% of my clients will say, I understand intellectually that something is better than nothing. Yeah. Right? But emotionally, that is not the case. Emotionally, it's it's got to yeah. be all in, right? And so intellectually, like, I think coaching, what I love about pairing them is coaching can really get at the intellectual. And a lot of times what we do in therapy is really get at what are the emotional barriers to engaging those things that you set with your, you know, your dietitian or your personal trainer or your health coach or other things. Like, why yeah. not? why you know what are those interfering beliefs about yourself yeah. for example um like self-worth you know like if you if you decide that you're going to take time off to exercise take time off of your family yeah. responsibilities you have to believe that yeah. you're worth that you have to believe that your worth matters as much as the worth of your kid or mm -hmm. your spouse or your boss or your whomever and the, or your, you know, ill family member in a lot yeah. of cases, right? And those are really hard things to balance when the pressures of the world can yeah. feel really intense. It's, it, it, you can almost get convinced yourself that it's selfish to take care of yourself. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really, to shift gears a little bit, uh, I, I, I was looking at your yeah. website a little bit uh, before our interview, and I did, I saw a video where you referenced weight loss medications and how you've worked with people who, who use them or who are on them and, um, and how they might be the right tool for some and, you know, depending on the person. But I'm, I'm super curious because it is newer to the landscape and we're all kind of watching at the same time. But from what you've seen in your one-on-one -on -one settings, um, I'm curious what you've, what you've witnessed, to, if you've witnessed weight loss meds having more of a positive impact or negative impact on individuals' health journeys. So of course my answer sure. is both, um, and and there's a variety of reasons. So, positively speaking, the reduction, as you've probably heard, of food noise, for example, um, is one major reason, right? Just the sort of relief that people feel from being constantly bombarded yeah. by what did I eat? What am I going to eat? What's yeah. there to eat? Should I eat that? Did I eat too much? Will I eat too much? Is that the right thing to eat? Just sort of constantly going. So that relief is huge. Even just hearing um, you say that is a relief I, to me. <laughs> it sounds so relieving. <laughs> I, I gave a talk recently at the Academies of Sciences and I shared like that sort of yeah. bombardment. When that goes away, I'll just, you know, even like when I change yeah. my voice, right? If, if that goes away, the peace, the quiet, the calmness that people feel far outweighs the weight. That is a huge piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. for many of my clients. Now, there are many other things mm -hmm. going on, right? Where people with history of disordered eating can be really not okay for them to just be sort of randomly prescribed mm -hmm. meds, right? Um, people with a strong drive for thinness, mm -hmm. that can be problematic because if the medications completely take away your appetite, which doesn't always happen, mm -hmm. but can, um, that can almost be risky for people. Mm -hmm. um, also, not everybody has the weight outcomes that you know we see on right. TikTok or something. Um, there are side effects and they are real. And people have to understand that these are not meant to be quick weight loss medications, right? These are really, um, in the science, what we call them as anti-obesity mm -hmm. medications. And they're really medications used to treat the chronic um, nature of having excess adipose mm -hmm. tissue. And if we think of it that way, it becomes a much more real conversation. Mm -hmm. If someone has chronic hypertension, for example, you want to give them the best treatment possible to manage the hypertension because you know that consistently untreated hypertension contributes to all sorts of other mm -hmm. problems. And so when you have consistently high levels of adipose tissue that is untreated mm -hmm. medically, it can result in all sorts of problems mm -hmm. in the long run. And so that's what I think of the GLPs and the other medications as really being a target mm -hmm. for. Um, and then there's there's a whole bunch of psychology, of course, involved in using them. There's a whole bunch of psychology involved in if you do lose a significant amount of weight and sort of identity shifts that 
happen, relationship yeah. shifts that happen, um, you know, self image that changes. And then the reality that we are in right now in May of 2024, when we're recording this is that there's a major supply issue mm -hmm. where people can't even get them if they have a prescription, the costs are astronomical for a lot of folks insurances don't always cover them even if insurance covers it they have a prescription and all of that not being able to access it is a problem um i just had a, a, a client reach out to me yesterday who is living in another country and went to her doctor to ask and the doctor's like we don't do that like basically sort of you know sloughed her off and she stood there and advocated for herself but she was hurt by those conversations so being on a med means you have to have a conversation with a medical mm -hmm. provider about it and that can bring up a whole bunch of yeah. stuff where you don't know who you're going to be interacting with is the doctor going to know that you're someone that has been working on this or are they going to just go tell you to lose weight yeah. on your own or there's all sorts of stuff not there, all doctors right? have the same bedside banner okay. <laughs> uh, yeah not even close <laughs> not even yeah. close yeah. yeah isn't there um a, cr a certain credential that physicians can get um, to show that they are more verse. So the ABOM, the obesity um, yes. board certification for obesity yeah. medicine is, is the sort of the gold standard, but, and, and ABOMs are certainly better than not ABOMs, but even within ABOMs, we have personalities, sure. right? And we have PS doctors have beliefs right. too. And doctors have their own biases, right? In the same way we have internalized bias mm -hmm. as a patient, doctors have bias and they have internalized bias and they have their own life experiences that inform how that interaction mm -hmm. goes. So, so yeah, I, I think you're, yeah. you're right about that. I think sometimes people look at doctors as maybe walking textbooks, but they're, they're also people with emotions and biases and thoughts. Yes. And we have to, you know, as a patient, it's not your job to help a doctor with that, but you can definitely sort of put in perspective. Yeah right, that this person is coming at it with this. And, and then behind the scenes, lots of us, uh, myself included, are working really hard to make some changes to the, the medical That's education great. That's a, that's a really noble thing you're working on there. Dr. Pashby, this has been an awesome time together. I feel like I could ask you so many more questions, but it, seem, it seems like the, I know. The, the moral of the story is increase your emotional literacy, your self-awareness, um, and probably if you struggle with a lot of these things, it's worth talking to a therapist, get working with a professional. I think that if I could share anything, it's this idea that mental health has as much stigma behind mm. it as weight. Yeah. And so for people that have struggled with weight and mental health conditions, it's sort of what we yeah. would say a double whammy, right? And so I hope that people will hear from people like me and know that I'm not some <laughs> scary, you know, I'm, I'm just a real person too who would challenge you to think a little bit differently about yourself, to think a little bit differently about the world, maybe to understand your own emotional landscape a little bit more um, deeply. And then from yeah. there, from a safe place of healing, real change, it happens. I see it every yeah. day. It's so interesting. Why, why do you think that stigma exists, the, the stigma of seeing a therapist? It seems like maybe it's getting better over the years, but I think you're right. I think it's still there. It's, it almost seems like it should be thought of as a good thing that you're trying to get yourself better. But where does that stigma come from, you think? It's all mm -hmm. shame-based, right? I mean, in our society, this whole idea of having your yeah. act together, whatever that yeah. means, is valued. And so if, mm -hmm. if you need help, no matter what kind of right. help that is, there's some sort of down-your-nose looking um, when it comes to mental health or things that have a societal belief of like, oh, you gotcha. should be able to do that on your own. I'm hoping that I'm helping sort of transform the landscape around that so that people understand brain health is no different than like, you know, bone health. That makes or all, yeah, else. like you wouldn't shame someone for going to see a doctor for breaking their arm. Um, we'll have to have you back on sometime. This has been so I would love to. I would love to. Maybe I'll come down. Even better. Sometime. We can do I'd one in to. person. All right. Thank all you right. so much. Thanks, David. See you next time. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Pashby today, talking about the role of shame, emotional eating, internalized weight bias, and we talked a little bit about weight loss meds, the role that they play. Hope you got value out of that. At the end of the day, remember, these episodes, these podcast episodes are for you. So be sure to comment, send us a message. Who else would you like to see us interview? What other subjects would you like to see us talk about? What questions do you have that you'd like us to help you get answered? At the end of the day, this is for you. As always, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.